Hello everyone, today we are at the Tank Museum at Bobbington and here is David Willey. Hello. And we talk about what you think is the most underrated Soviet tank in the Second World War. So, just very quickly thinking this one through, there's a tank that ultimately, when you look at it, leads me to think it's the precursor of all of that post-war frying pan shaped turret Russian tanks and that's a T-44 and in a sense for me that you know I could argue the T-34 is just a good one to debate because some people love it some people you know but it's the most knocked out tank of all time so you could almost look at the T-34 why the T-44 is because again it's that moment in time where here we've got a new design It's quite radical in some respects. When you look at it, it's very forward thinking. It looks like an embryonic T-54. Um, but back to, and it brings in this whole issue that we, again, as tank fans, unless you go back to the factories and what goes on in the factories in wartime, the fact that the Russians like it, think it's, they do start putting some of them into production, But the realization it would be much more beneficial to upgrade the T-34 with a new turret and an 85 millimeter gun, that would be practically the best thing to do because in terms of production, we can do this easier. And we are talking about numbers again for the Russian military. Therefore, we're going to go for an upgrade on the T-34 and wait out on that T-44, even though they make a few hundred, I believe, before the end of the war. Um, even though when we then look back and think radically that is the tank and the style of tank that they're going to build in huge quantities, well, probably the most of all time, T-54s and T-55s, you know, huge numbers ultimately built based on something that really is the T-44. So that for me is one of those ones where we can overlook it, but it's, it's a way forward But understandably, the Russians decide, no, we're not going to go for that. We're going for the upgrade because in times of warfare, you do not want to shut your factories down to completely retool, to do all this differently, because that's the same as Britain in 1940. Why we didn't go into the newer models, why the six pounder takes time, because when you stop your factories, if that's the moment, however good you are, a couple of months before you've all retooled, got everything ready for the new version, you've lost staff, skills have gone. All of those things happen, and, and we have in Britain continuation orders. We are ordering tanks we don't want just to keep the factory going until this next model is going to be ready, because otherwise you, 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 you'll lose the staff and the skill sets, etc. So things like that, you know, that's one of those ones where it's, it's, it's a tank that shows the way to the future, but it's understandably put to one side, we're going to carry on developing the T-34. And that's a model we all see really as the answer to the Panther with the 85 millimeter gun. And that's made in those vast quantities for the rest of the war and does the business, if you would argue, from the Russian point of view. Oh. Yeah, the T-44, I hadn't time to look at it at all so far. It's, it's quite interesting. I always know it's there, but I think l l lately uh, somebody showed me a picture and I was like, What is this? It kind of looks like a T-55, but it isn't. And he said it's a T-44, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. It jumps the gun type of thing, you know. It's that, it's that way of, and again, you know, without getting too obscure, all those things. But, you know, there, there's, there's Russian vehicles that, you know, that are decimated early in the war. We never see again lighter vehicles, KV ones. Everyone likes, or we we love the look of the modern elements for JS2, you know, JS3 at the end of the war and everything. But For me, that, that, just going back to that point, you know, that, that's where, again, the sophistication of some of the Soviet tank design is, is quite surprising in many ways when we just think of large numbers, crudity and mass production, you know, so it's... Uh... Yeah, they went, they went down a different route. I mean, T-55 and everything is, is perfectly optimized in a, in mm. a way and it, it, it goes a, a different philosophy, as you can see, yeah. Well, not at the dentist, by the way. Sorry, that's the workshops yeah. next door in the background <laughs> that are doing that drilling noise. So. At that point, there was a loss of words, which is quite uncommon for me. So I decided to give you some basic information about the T-44. And in the end, you can also see how David and I had some fun with my speechless situation. There were several attempts during the Second World War to replace the T-34, namely the T-34M, the T-43 and the T-44. 
The main difference between these three was that the first two would have reused components from the T34, particularly for the T43, this was a reason for its failure, according to Yuri Hasherlock. The T44 design team took some inspiration from captured Panther tanks, particularly the center turret, which made it a more stable firing platform than the front place turrets on the T34 and KV tanks. Yet the Panther had various drawbacks, like the heavy weight being rather tall and the frontal transmission. To keep the size and weight of the tank lower, the design team went with a smaller engine compartment. The only way to achieve this was to place the engine perpendicular to the hull. This solution was not new, as the MS-1 tank already had a perpendicular engine. However, in this case it had a specially designed engine that had a gearbox as part of the same assembly. The initial goal was to have a weight of 30 tons. In November 1943 an order was signed to build two experimental prototypes that should be finished by 1st February 1944. To put this in context, the upgraded T-34 with the 85mm gun started production in January 1944. Stalin had a keen interest in the T-44 and wanted regular updates. During the first tries the tank did very well and it was clearly better than the T-34. Even in terms of fuel efficiency, it was a bit better than the T-34. Besides some minor issues, the tank was also reliable. One problem was attributed to the fact that some parts were manufactured with defects. Trials showed not just a higher speed and better fuel economy, but also a reduction of the effort required to steer the tank. The T-34 took 20 to 24 kg of effort to steer, the prototype T-44 took only 13 to 16 kg. There was also a marked improvement in observation, especially from the driver's point of view. Yet further trials showed up some problems. The air cooling of the engine and oil tank proved insufficient. Additionally, the oil tank was next to the exhaust system, which heated it up more. The oil temperature reached 110 degrees, even in winter spring conditions. There were also issues with the fan drive, which broke constantly. There were also complaints about the reliability of the gear train and final drives. The main issue of the T-34 tanks, destruction of road wheel rims, was still present. There were other issues as well. One particular problem became apparent during the penetration trials in April 1944. The driver's cabin turned out to be too weak. A second set of prototypes was ordered and various changes were made. One aspect was a complete rework of the turret. Around mid-May 1944 the improved prototypes were put on trial. Many more trials followed over the course of the summer. The results were mixed. The commission failed the T-44, though it was evaluated quite highly. The GBTU and the NKTP understood both the potential of this vehicle and issues linked to rushing it. That being said, the commission recommended the T-44 for service if the outline defects could be resolved. Additional various changes were also requested like the increase in armor strength, ammo and fuel capacity. Apparently the tank had enough promise and maybe interest from Stalin. He signed a decree on 18th July 1944 about the start of the production. This decree expected the first 25 tanks in November 1944. The T-44 was essentially accepted into service in advance. Further trials with the prototypes and improved prototypes were performed. Now technically Stalin's decree gave the permission for the T-44 to be a replacement for the T-34. Yet we know that the T-44 never succumbed in the Second World War and even after the Second World War it never took over. Around 8100 were built, which is considered very low, at least for solid medium tanks. The T-34 had more than 50,000 built in World War II alone. So what happened? The first five production T-44 tanks out of a quota of 25 were delivered before the end of November of 1944. Then KTP had no illusions about the quality of these tanks knowing what tribulations factory number 75 was going through. These tanks were classified as combat training. Yet following the production tanks had various issues as well. The quality was too low. As of January 28th 1945 not a single tank had been accepted. By summer 1945 various changes were made. The improved situation allowed for an increase in quotas. Factory number 75 was required to deliver 100 tanks in July, 120 in August and 135 in September. However, the cost increased to 290,000 rubles. To compare, an IS-3 tank cost 295,000 rubles, which was a heavy tank. The issue was that the tank was complicated to produce. 
This is very similar to the conclusion by Steven Saloga why the T44 did not replace the T3485 after the second world war. In the medium tank category, T4485 production continued until 1946, largely because it was the only reliable type in production. There had been plans to replace it with the T44 starting in 1945, but this new design proved to be mechanically troublesome. More importantly, it was armed with the same 85mm gun as the T3485, but it was significantly more expensive. The only combat operation, if one wants to call it that, the T-44 saw was well in the suppression of the Budapest uprising in 1956. Not much. Uh, that will be short yeah, video. I've just stumped you with that one, you see. There you go. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah, don't yeah. the Russians like that. You're, you got me. Uh... <laughs> You're not supposed to say it like that. <laughs> oh, he's got me. <laughs> that's a, uh, I have something I can't, I can't comment on. That's, that's, that's a new thing, I guess, the first time for the chair. <laughs> Well, I didn't even know I was going to be saying all this, so if we are still so, running the camera. So, so, so yeah, yeah. I uh, will edit out a few things, I oh, guess. Oh, no, no, you've got to leave all that stuff in. That's what you're... Okay, yeah, you're fine with that. So now I have the camera. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, use perfect. whatever you like. Yeah. Go on, you've got another question. Yeah, yeah. Unless you need to finish this one. That, that's a new video. So I'll finish on behalf. Um, so I'm just saying thank you very much for joining us here at the Tank Museum. So I'm so terribly sorry. You're stumped for questions at the moment. But as ever, I'll talk for England. So, but bye-bye. <laughs> thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs>